This video is about splints and tractions. Welcome to Med with Med Simple. If you are new to my channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon next to it so that you'll get notified as soon as I upload new videos. First, let's start our discussion by looking at splints. Splints are basically the devices which are used for immobilization and the most common use of splints is in fractures. In fractures, you'll know that there'll be formation of bony fragments or there'll be a separation of the bone at the fracture site. And this uh, fractured uh, site of the bones are usually sharp and they can uh, rupture the nearby neurovascular structures leading to damage of the neurovascular structures. In order to prevent this, uh, these damages, uh, the best thing to be done at the, site, uh, at the site of fracture as soon as fracture happens is to immobilize the fractured limb and that can be achieved with the help of splints. So it is not necessary to have a medical device uh, to be used as splint if it is not available. You can use anything which is available nearby like a cardboard or you can use a folded newspaper or something like that to provide the splint to the patient. And it is also used in some other conditions to immobilize the joints, like in cases of infections, congenital dislocation of hip, backache, and so many other conditions. But the most common use of splints is to immobilize the fractured bones. There are a huge number of splints available, uh, starting from Kramer splint, and the list goes on. Uh, so much and it's not necessary to remember all the splints which are gonna, I'm going to be telling about right now. So first let's see the list. Uh, we have Kramer wire splint, Thomas splint, Bowler brown splint, aluminium splint, Dennis brown splint, cock up splint, knuckle bender splint, toe rising splint, walkman splint, four post collar, aeroplane splint, somi brace, ash brace, Taylor brace, milwalk brace, Boston brace, lumbar corset, and the list keeps going. And it is not necessary necessary to know all these splints unless you are an orthopedician. If you're a medical student, uh, it's fine if you know the most commonly used splints. But if you're interested, you can go to Google and you can search these splints, and the image will pop up just like that. And I, I, I it will be uh, really nice if you can. I know all these splints because you'll be seeing most of the patients or many patients at least uh, will, will be using these splints okay so I, I, if you want you can go to google and you can search all these splints but in this video i'll be talking about the most commonly used splints okay first let's start our discussion about looking at grammar wire splint so this picture is uh, this picture represents grammar wire splint okay this is just a hand drawn picture of grammar wire splint in this picture, you can see two parallel thick wires right here, and in between there are interlacing thin uh, wires which are present between the two thick parallel wires. Okay, and uh, this Kramer wire splint is actually uh, used as a temporary splint. Okay, so when you find a patient uh, at the site of road traffic accident or something like that, and you're going to transfer the patient from that side to emergency department. Uh, before transferring the patient, you can use this Kramer wire splint, which is readily available to most of the paramedics. And this, the advantage of this uh, Kramer wire splint is that it is um, flexible and it can be bent to different shapes. So it can be used for different uh, joints or different uh, bones, okay, different joint fractures or bone fractures. That is the advantage of Kramer wire splint. Now let's see about Thomas splint. In this picture, you can see the parts of thumb splint. We have ring, we have an outer bar, and we have an in inner bar. This outer bar has a curve in its upper part, and that is to accommodate the greater trochanter of the femur. As you, as you, as you guys know that, that part of the uh, lower limb is a bit wide, and that's why this part has a curve, okay? So this is a basic representation of one of the most commonly used splints, the Thomas splint. Uh, this uh, now I'm going to be telling you about uh, a formula to calculate the size of Thomas splint for individual patients. Okay, so the ring size of the Thomas splint is calculated by adding two inches to the thigh circumference of the patient, and the length of the Thomas splint is calculated by measuring the highest point on the medial side of the groin to heel, and to that you need to add six inches, and that will give you the length of the Thomas splint. Now let's see about Bowler Brown splint. 
The bowler bond splint has three pulleys. Each of these pulleys has different functions. Okay, the one which is present in the lower right corner of uh, of this picture, uh, that pulley is helpful in providing calcaneal or distal tibial traction. So this is not very complicated. As this name suggests, uh, this pulley will help in providing traction from the calcaneum or from the distal tibia. Okay. And the pulley which is present right above it is actually helpful in providing distal femoral or proximal tibial uh, traction. Okay, so as you can uh, understand by what I say, uh, that pulley is actually helpful in providing traction from the uh, from uh, from the bone parts which are present around the knee joint. Okay, that is uh, distal uh, femur and uh, proximal uh, tibia. So that uh, this pulley is actually helpful in providing traction from these sides and the pulley which is present in the top left uh, of among these all these uh, three pulleys is actually helpful in changing the angle uh, to uh, angle to which the traction has to be applied so these are the three pulleys which are used in bowler brown splint and uh, so these are the various functions which all these three pulleys provide the bowler brown splint is somewhat more convenient than the thomas splint and uh, the advantage of the bowler bronze splint uh, as compared to the Kramer wire splint or anything like that is actually that it can provide tractions. So the points to remember uh, when we are providing splintage, uh, uh, splints to any patients are to apply the splint properly. The splint should neither be too loose and it should not be too uh, tight also. And the patient should be advised to exercise the muscles and joints and the physiotherapy plays a role here uh, because if the patient is going to be resting uh, after applying the splints uh, without doing any activity for those joints and muscles for a prolonged period of time, uh, they'll develop deformities and muscle wastings and all that. To avoid that, the patient should be advised to exercise the muscles and joints involved. You should be constantly looking for compression of nerves or vessels because of tight applying of the splintage and the splints should be uh, daily checked uh, and uh, the fracture sites should be checked with the help of x-rays and should be made sure that they are approximated properly the fractured ends are approximated properly now let's see about tractions tractions basically involves uh, the pulling of the fractured bones from one side and uh, as you can see here this uh, picture of a tug of war will be providing traction from one end and this has to be counteracted by a counter traction from the other end and this is the principle which is involved in traction traction helps in quicker um, union of the bone and it promotes fracture healing okay so we'll be seeing about tractions in a bit more detail traction helps in reduction of fractures and dislocations it helps in immobilizing a painful inflamed inflame joint. It also helps in prevention of deformity by keeping the uh, fractured uh, uh, fractured parts of the bones uh, stretched. It also helps in keeping the fractured uh, helps in keeping the muscles which are, are surrounding the fractured uh, bones to be uh, in stretched positions, and this will prevent the formation of deformity. Because when fracture happens, there will be inflammation around the joints also and that will cause inflammation of the soft tissues and muscles which are present around the fractured bones. And this traction will, uh, this uh, inflammation can cause uh, the spasticity of the muscles around the fractured bone leading to formation of spasticity and deformity. So when we apply traction, the fractured uh, uh, segments of the bones will be stretched and along with that, there will be stretching of the muscles and soft tissue around the fractured bones and this will prevent the formation of any deformity it also helps in correction of soft tissue contractures by keeping them stretched there are two types of tractions namely fixed traction and sliding traction uh, these two basically vary uh, by the type uh, by the type of counter traction applied for example if we use thomas splint as we saw with a splint which we saw uh, previously uh, and if we apply traction with the help of a uh, thomas splint the counter traction will be provided by the ring of the thomas splint the ring of the thomas splint will press against the ischial tuberosity of the patient and this will provide counter traction for the traction which we provide with the help of weights okay 
In case of sliding traction, the body weight of the patient itself will help in providing counter traction. This can be achieved by keeping the leg end or the foot end of the bed of the patient elevated and the traction will be applied. Now what happens here is that the body weight of the patient itself will uh, act as counter traction. This is the difference between fixed traction and sliding traction. Now there are different methods of traction namely skin traction and skeletal traction. Skin, in, in skin traction, a adhesive strap is usually placed or attached to the skin of the patient and it will be attached to the skin so that what will happen is the pressure, the force will be transmitted from the strap via the skin to the deep, uh, deep tissues of the, uh, of the limb to the muscles and it will go deep to the bone. The force will be transmitted to the bone. Okay, and this will provide the traction and the force uh, the force provided here in skin traction will be very less. In the case of skeletal traction, we'll be inserting um, some, uh, some pins or needles or something like that and with the help of that, uh, we'll provide the traction. So, we'll be, this is an uh, invasive procedure. This is an invasive procedure whereas the skin traction is a non-invasive procedure. So, this is the difference between skin traction and skeletal traction. And the one more thing which is important to know is skin traction can be preferred for children whereas skeletal traction can be prepared, uh, preferred for uh, uh, adults, okay? And the, the maximum weight which can be applied in the case of skin traction is about uh, 3 to 4 kg whereas in the case of skeletal traction, um, you can apply weight of almost uh, uh, up to 20 kgs, okay? So these are some of the differences between skin traction and skeletal traction. So there are various tractions such as gallows traction, Bryan traction, uh, and uh, there are some more tractions like, uh, well, Russell's traction, okay? This Russell traction is actually used for intertrochantric fractures in femurs, okay? So things to ensure when we provide tractions are uh, it should be comfortable for the patient and you should ensure that everything is set properly uh, once uh, setting of traction has been done and you should check for sensations and color and temperature of the distal limb uh, to make sure that there is no uh, tight compression of the neurovascular structures because of the traction and you should look for any swelling in the toes or fingers you should check for pin tract infection okay so the, the pin tract can get infected and uh, it can lead to it can impair the fracture healing and we should be checking it constantly and we can uh, we can do x-rays uh, over the fracture site and we can ensure that they are approx the fracture ends are approximated properly and if healing is taking place normally and as i told you physiotherapy should be encouraged for the patient so that that will be uh, the uh, the wasting of the muscles and deformity of joints can be reduced to a greater extent should be checking for complications due to bed rest uh, this includes bed sores and all that, okay? Since the patient uh, is um, is in bed for a prolonged period of time, he can develop uh, bed sores and all that, so we should be constantly checking for complications due to long bed rest. And we, uh, and this is one thing which um, uh, can be additional, which can provide additional benefit to the patient. This thing is called a diversion therapy. Since this patient is in bed for a long time, he's uh, more prone to have uh, psycho psychologic stress, right? So uh, he should be encouraged to uh, play some indoor games or something like that to distract himself and feel better. And this will provide some of the, some uh, psychological support for the patient. We came to the end of this video. Uh, uh, you can follow me on Instagram at uh, Medwitch Made Simple One, and I've recently introduced Medwitch Made Simple Quiz, uh, where I'll be posting quiz questions uh, every day. And the person who answers the question first will get 10 points. And once you reach 50 points, you'll get shout out on Instagram as well as on my YouTube videos. And I released this new merch. Uh, if you guys uh, like this merch, actually it is available. These are available in various colors, and I'll provide the links of uh, these merch in the description of this video. And the uh, and you can click on the I, which is uh, which is visible on the screen right now, and that will also help you to that will take you to the link to uh, check out this merch. Uh, if you guys buy any of these merch, make sure to uh, post pictures of uh, these merch uh, of you with this merch on Instagram and tag me. 
on on the post or send these pictures directly to me on Instagram and uh, I will give you a shout out on Instagram as well as my YouTube videos okay so we came to the end of this video if you like my videos if you guys want me to make more videos you can support my channel by donating on www.patreon.com slash medwithmedsimple if you guys want me to make more videos uh, you can also help me by sharing my videos to your friends and telling them to subscribe to my channel and if you haven't subscribed already make sure to hit the subscribe button right now so that you'll not miss out any of my videos thank you for watching i'll see you guys in my next video